Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this particular series is entitled Managing for the Master Till He Comes. And this lesson number four that we're studying today is for January 28 of 23, entitled Offerings for Jesus. Offerings, we've been talking about tithe, Offerings, now this is a different category, I guess. Uh, let's begin with the word of prayer. Father, we have come together to study your word and try to understand more clearly what are your requirements of us. May we uh, read and study together in a way to understand best is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. A lot of people think that the returning of the tithes was the only financial obligation of the ancient Israelites. If you remember our previous lessons, we have mentioned that um, they were probably required to pay up to 25%. They were expected to give sin offerings as well as thank offerings for the blessings of health, prosperity, and the sustaining power of God. They were also expected to give offerings to support the poor and for the building up and maintenance of the house of worship. Each one was expected to give in proportion to the way God had blessed him. Jim? Well, the writer of Ellen White, the Lord does not need our offerings. We cannot enrich him by our gifts. Says the psalmist, all things come, to th come of thee, and of thine own have we given thee. First Chronicles 29, 14. Yet God permits us to show our appreciation of his mercies by self-sacrificing efforts to extend the same to others. This is the only way to which, excuse me, in which our, it is possible for us to manifest our gratitude, gratitude and love to God. He is provided no other. Ellen White from the okay. Review and Herald, December okay. 87. David stated, stated that basic principle thousands of years earlier in the verse quoted there, First Chronicles 29, 14. Carrie? But who am I, and what is my people, that we should be able to offer so willingly after this sort? For all things come of thee, and of thine own have we given thee. That's from the King James Version. Now, do you remember the background of that verse? David had wanted to build the temple for God in Jerusalem. And God said, no, you've done too much killing. I want your son to build a temple. So David goes back to God and he says, well, can I at least collect the resources, the goods necessary for the, absolutely no problem. And he called for people to donate and they came in. If you read all the stuff that was donated, it was amazing. So money is a big issue. It consumes the time and thoughts of many people. In the Bible study guide, Jesus spent more time talking about money and wealth than just about any other subject. One verse in every six in Matthew, Mark, and Luke is about money. The gospel's good news is that God can deliver us from the misuse and love of money. In the Bible study guide for Sunday. So how much has God done for us? What would be a proportional gift to return to him? Well, if it was going to be proportional to what he's done for us, we would have to give him everything, wouldn't we? Matthew 6, 31 to 34, Jesus said, So do not start worrying. Where will my food come from, or my drink, or my clothes? These are the things that pagans are always concerned about. Your Father in heaven knows that you need all these things. Instead, be concerned about everything above everything else with the kingdom of God and with what he requires of you, and he will provide you with all these other things. So do not worry about tomorrow. It will have enough worries of its own. There is no need to add to the troubles each day brings. And that's from our Good News Bible, Good News Translation. Then we have a passage in Deuteronomy 28, 1 to 14, that spells out a lot of details about the tithe. Jim? Deuteronomy 28, 1 to 14. Moses told the Israelites, if you obey the Lord your God and faithfully keep all his commands that I am giving you today, 
He will make you greater than any other nation on earth. Obey the Lord your God, and all these things, all these blessings will be yours. <clears throat> the Lord will bless your towns and your fields. The Lord will bless you with many children, with abundant crops, and with many cattle and sheep. The Lord will bless you, bless your corn crops and the food you are prepared for, him, for them. The Lord will bless everything you do. The Lord will defeat your enemies when they attack you, and they will attack from one direction, but they will run from you in all directions. The Lord your God will bless your work and fill your barns with corn. He will bless you in the land that he is giving you. If you obey the Lord your God and do everything he commands, he will make you his own people as he has promised. Then all the people on earth will see that the Lord has chosen you to be his own people and that they will be afraid of you. The Lord will be Excuse me. The Lord will give you many children, many cattle, and abundant crops in the land that he has promised your ancestors to give you. He will send you rain in season from his rich storehouse in the sky and, blesses, and bless all your work so that you will lend to many nations, but you will not have to borrow from many. The Lord your God will make you the leader among the nations and not a follower. You will always be, always prosper and never fail if you obey faithfully all his commands that I am giving you today. But you must never disobey them in any way or worship and serve other gods from the Good News Bible. Okay. With a list of promises like that, how can you lose? <laughs> I mean, yeah. And then, of course, what, was, what happened? They disobeyed. And they didn't they listen. They didn't listen again and again and again and again. So our offerings are not given in an effort to pay for or buy salvation. Some people have that impression and some churches give you that impression. They are not for the purpose of appeasing God's wrath or to gain his favor. We can think of some other churches there. Deuteronomy 16 gives some other ideas. Carrie? Deuteronomy 16, 16 to 17. All the men of your nation are to come to worship the Lord three times a year at the one place of worship, at Passover, Harvest Festival, and the Festival of Shelters. Each man is to bring a gift as he is able in proportion to the blessings that the Lord your God has given him. That's from the Good News Bible. So you're supposed to pay your tithes, but in addition to that, you're supposed to bring a gift in proportion to what God has given you. Okay, go ahead. Luke 12, 48, in brackets there, Jesus said, for everyone to whom much is given, from him much will be required. That's the New King James Version. Comparing us to the generation... Okay, hold on just a minute. Let's, let's, let's talk about that for a moment. How do you know how much you need to give? If you feel like you're really blessed, do you give more? How, how do you understand that verse? There's no, there's no percentages or anything like that given there. You're supposed to just say, well, I feel like I'm blessed. Or maybe I don't feel like I'm blessed, so therefore I don't have to give anything. Yeah. Well, the church has worked this all out. Uh -huh. You give the 10% tithe, you give the 3% offerings, and three, uh, another 3% for church budget, and so on and so forth. And so, you know, you've okay. got guidelines. I see. Comparing us to the generations that have preceded us, how much have we been given? Much. Are we who live in the more developed nations really the most blessed and privileged generation that has ever lived on this earth? Probably. Yes, probably. Of course, we could never repay God for what he has done for us. Our gifts returned to God should demonstrate that we have moved from selfishness, which is our national, natural human condition, to love. We should care about others and we should care about God's cause. So what do your offerings, your tithe paying, and your attitude uh, as you do those things say about your relationship with God? 
we've already read Deuteronomy 16, 16, and 17. Each time they went to the temple, they were to take a gift proportional to all the blessings God had given them. Well, it's easy to see why scholars have just suggested that the Israelites gave around 20% of, 25% of the increase to the Levites in the temple. That included the tithes and all the sacrifices and all the other offerings. And if you have read through portions of the Old Testament recently, there were times when the temple was in bad shape and they called for massive offerings to repair it again and so forth like that. Um, of course, that's probably because they hadn't been paying their tithes before that. Or that the Levites were taking too much. Giving was clearly a central part of their worship. This is reflected by verses like 1 Corinthians 16, 29. Let's just look at that. I'm 1 Chronicles, thank you. 1 Chronicles 16, 29. Praise the Lord's glorious name. Bring an offering and come into his temple. Bow down before the Holy One when he appears. And Psalms 96, 8, and 9. Praise the Lord's glorious name. Bring an offering and come into his temple. Bow down before the Holy One when he appears. Tremble before him all the earth. And you can see that's a repetition, pretty much. Psalm 116 is the same. They were repeatedly instructed to go to the temple and take an offering. As you return the mandatory tithes and free will offerings to the church organization, do you feel that this is a duty, a privilege, an opportunity, or primarily a responsibility? Do we dare to answer that question? In addition to paying tithes and giving regular offerings to the church, some Christians like to dedicate a significant gift to a specific project, either in one's own church or somewhere else in the world, and then see the work being accomplished. It may give one a great feeling of satisfaction. And Carrie, you and I are aware of the Adventist World Radio, for example, and all that they're doing. Yes. We feel comfortable, we feel blessed giving to an organization like that, part of the church ministry. And they, they keep sending us uh, newsletters telling about the great things that are being done in places like the Philippines and other places, <clears throat> and Israel even. Yeah. Uh, consider a very important story about Jesus and offerings, Mark, Mark 12, 41 to 44. In the Good News Bible, as Jesus sat near the temple treasury, he watched the people as they dropped in their money. Many rich men dropped in a lot of money. Then a poor widow came along and dropped in her two little copper coins, worth about a penny. He, that is Jesus, called the disciples together and said to them, I tell you that this poor widow put more in the offering box than all the others. For the others put in what they had to spare of their riches, but she, poor as she is, put in all she had. She gave all she had to live on. Wow. While this is an exemplary story, would God ever expect us to give our last two cents to some project, even if it is important or as, or as an offering? Is this, um, I mean, think of how many times this story has been used as an offering appeal and people have given generously, often. Not always, but often. The Savior called his disciples to him and this is from Desire of Ages. Yeah, from Desire of Ages, from Ellen White. The Savior called his disciples to him and bade them mark the widow's poverty. Then his words of commendation fell upon her ear. Quote, Of a truth I say unto you, this, that this poor woman, this poor widow, hath cast in more than they all. Tears of joy filled her eyes as she felt that her act was understood and appreciated. Do you think God blessed her? Presumably. I am sure that God blessed her because of this story. Many would have advised her to keep her pittance for her own use. Given into the hands of the well-fed priests, it would be a lost sight of among the many costly gifts brought to the treasury. But Jesus understood her motive. She believed the service of the temple to be of God's appointment, and she was, was anxious to do her utmost to sustain it. 
She did what she could, and her act was to be a monument to her memory through all time, and her joy and eternity. Her heart went with her gift. Its value was estimated not by the worth of the coin, but by the love to God and the interest in his work that had prompted the deed. And I'm thinking about sometimes, I've seen times when uh, offerings have been taken from, from a whole congregation um, in places where people are poor and maybe there's the whole thing, it adds up to a dollar or two, something like that. And uh, do you think that uh, those people are blessed more because they give of their what little they have? Are we supposed to be the rich people who give in lots? Well, Bible study guide says, in the example of the poor widow in Mark 12, 41 to 44, the word who became flesh took time to sit and observe the givers who preceded her, examining the motives and the amounts deposited in his house for the advancement of his work. Acts 4, 36 and 37, and Mark 14, 3 through 9, from a quote in our Bible study guide. Another very significant point is that this is, this is the only gift Jesus ever commended. A gift to a church that was just about to reject him, a church that greatly de deviated from its calling and mission. And yet, what did Jesus say? He commended her, didn't he? Another example of generous giving is the story of Cornelius, the Roman centurion from Caesarea. What do we know about Cornelius? <laughs> Acts 10, 1 to 4. There was a man in Caesarea named Cornelius, who was a captain of, in the Roman regiment called the Italian Regiment. He was a religious man, and he and his whole family worshiped God. He also did much to help the Jewish poor people and was constantly praying for God, <laughs> praying to God. It was about three o'clock one afternoon when he had a vision in which he clearly saw the, an angel of the Lord come in and say to him, Cornelius. He stared at the angel in fear and said, What is it, sir? The angel answered, God is pleased with your prayers and works of charity and is ready to answer you from the Good News Bible. Good from the Bible study guide, apparently not only are our prayers heard in heaven, but the motive of our gifts also is noted. The passage notes that Cornelius was a generous giver for there, excuse me, for where our your treasures are, there your heart will be also. Matthew 6, 21 from the New King James Version. The heart of Cornelius followed his gifts. He was ready to learn more about Jesus. Prayer and almsgiving are closely linked and demonstrate our love to God and for our fellow men. The two great principles of God's law. You shall love the Lord your God and with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. Luke, 6, Luke 10 verse 27 from the New King James Version. The first is revealed in prayer. The second is in almsgiving. Okay. Excuse me. So uh, our dedication to God is seen through our prayers and our study, Bible study I would include. And then of, co of course we have a chance to help others through our almsgiving. Almsgiving is offerings? Yes, almsgiving would be now. Um, it's not you, in the vocabulary of everyone. No, you might be aware that there's a lot of, there was a lot of differences of opinion about almsgiving and about charity in the translation of the Bible back in its early stages. The Catholic Church absolutely insisted that when it came to uh, the word for love in, in 1 Corinthians 13, it had to be charity. Not just love, couldn't use the word love, charity. Because of course, what were they thinking about? Donations to the church. And then also part of it was, would be penance. You yeah. make the donation for, as penance rather than repentance. Yeah. A lot of times they don't give you any choice. I remember a farmer I knew when I was uh, 
a youngster, the priest would come around and say, Mr. Maley, 3,000 pounds from you. And they did it. Really? Oh, yes. Well, I can, I, I will tell you a story from my teenage years when I was in academy. Uh, someone there who had relatives who were Roman Catholics uh, decided to go on the Christmas Eve concert, uh, um, probably it was a mass, a Christmas Eve mass, went with his relatives there to the Catholic Church. And the priest got up and said, you people need to be giving more offerings. Let me give you as an example what the people in the Seventh-day Adventist Church do. <laughs> <laughs> and he went on, and he had quoted numbers and everything, and I, I don't know how that infected them, but of course you can imagine our Adventist brother, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's perking up there. Whoa! <laughs> so I had a friend who was Catholic, and uh, mm -hmm. he said, my church gives by the, a small amount, the members give a small amount by millions of people. Your church, you give a lot more per member, but there are fewer members. I see. So that's the explanation, huh? The masses as opposed to large, large percents. And our guide reminds us that for your heart will always be where your riches are. Clearly, Cornelius was moved by the whole story of Jesus and he was ready to learn more about him. Most of us have two different portions of our assets, let's talk about this now, that we deal with on a regular basis. A smaller portion is fairly liquid and is used to buy all the regular necessities of daily living and perhaps for paying tithes and giving offerings. The larger set of assets includes vehicles and homes or other major investments. A major gift from this asset class is called a big jar gift. Have you ever given a big jar gift? Well, the differences in the percentages of liquid and non-liquid assets can be illustrated by putting 1,000 pennies in two different glass jars, with 10 pennies representing each percentage point. So you would have 90 pennies in a small jar representing the 9% liquid assets and 910 pennies in a large quart-sized jar representing the 91% of non-liquid assets. And that's, I'm sure they got those stat statistics from looking at government-issued information about people's money and so forth. So, coming back to our lesson, a person who made an astonishing big jar gift was Mary. Jim? Kerry. Uh, Kerry, I'm sorry, Kerry. Okay. Uh, using Mark 14, 3 to 9. Jesus was in Bethany at the house of Simon, a man who had suffered from a dreaded skin disease. While Jesus was eating, a mother, a woman rather. L let me interrupt for a second. And what happened to his dreaded skin disease? He was healed. By? By Jesus. By Jesus, yeah. So this is why he's, offer, he's, he's inviting people to come to his house and celebrate. He has been healed by Jesus. Okay, go ahead. Right, uh, I've got to stop and think where I was. Well, Jesus? I mean, with an alabaster jar full of a very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on Jesus' head. Some of the people there became angry and said to one another, what was the use of wasting the perfume? It could have been sold for more than 300 silver coins and the money given to the poor, and they criticized her harshly. But Jesus said, leave her alone. Why are you bothering her? She has done a fine and beautiful thing for me. You will always have poor people with you, and any time you want to, you can help them. But you will not always have me. She did what she could. She poured perfume on my body to prepare it ahead of time for burial. Now I assure you that whatever the gospel is preached all over the world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. And that's from the Good News Bible. Now if you put all four of the gospels together carefully and you figure out the timing here, this great ceremony, this great meal was was took place uh, just about a week before uh, Jesus' crucifixion. And it, it, it happened, apparently, 
just after they had marched up from Jericho, well, the big crowd that he was with had traveled all the way from Galilee down to Jericho, across the river, marching up to Jerusalem. And what was what was they what were they talking about the whole way? Crown we're we're going to take Jesus up to Jerusalem and we're going to crown him king. And all of a sudden, he's talking about my burial. Hmm. Well, let's look at some more of this story. Thus Mary became the only one of his close followers who managed to anoint his body for burial either before the burial or at the time of his burial. So now who brought spices for burying him? Joseph of Arimathea. Joseph of Arimathea. Was he a close follower? And, and I think Nicodemus. Well, yeah, one of them, yeah. I think one of them brought the wrapping and the other body spices anyway. Joseph had, or the Arimathea, didn't he have the tomb? Yes, yeah. Provided the tomb. And probably Nicodemus then provided the others, okay. So, John 12, 2 to 8. That would be me. That's mine. They prepared a dinner for him there, which Martha helped to serve. Lazarus was one of those who was sitting at the table with Jesus. Now, what had happened to Lazarus a little while before this? He was raised from the dead, exactly. So here, here's Jesus sitting. On one side is Simon, who's been healed of leprosy. On the other side is Lazarus, who's been raised from the dead. That's a pretty impressive showing, isn't it? Yes. Then Mary took a half a liter of a very expensive perfume made of pure nard, poured it on Jesus' feet. And uh, in Mark, it says he poured it on his head and wiped them uh, with her hair. The sweet smell of the perfume filled the whole house. One of Jesus' disciples, that is Judas Iscariot, the one who was going to betray him, said, why wasn't this perfume sold for 300 silver coins and the money given to the poor? Yeah. He mm -hmm. said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He carried the money bag and would help himself from it. This is, from, this is from the writings of John. Yes. Inspired in the Bible. Yes. I want to interrupt here for a second. No. I, you know, you, well, you, of course, you know that there have been movies made about this and so forth, but how, how would every woman who had anything to do with Jesus not been attracted by him? I mean, you know, Mary, what, she, what, what must she have thought of Jesus? Yeah. I mean, just... Anyway, go Verse ahead. Verse 7, but Jesus said, leave her alone, that is, leave Mary alone. Let her keep what she has uh, for the day of my burial. You will always have poor people with you, but you will not always have me, from the Good News Bible. Now, let's talk about the family here a little bit. Martha was a consummate hostess. And remember what Jesus said to her on another occasion? Martha, Martha, you're always worried about everything, but Mary has chosen the better part because Mary was doing what? Sitting at the feet of Jesus. Mary was not doing the dishes or preparing the food. No. <laughs> and she was probably asked to host us at Uncle Simon's feast to celebrate his healing from leprosy by Jesus and the resurrection of Lazarus who sat next to Jesus. What is so amazing in that story is the fact that Mary was Simon's niece. Let's see how we can determine that. And Simon had led Mary into sin. Mary's life, so his niece, Mary's life of sin probably began with that incest which led her all the way to demon possession. And you can read about that in more detail in Desire of Ages by Ellen White, 558 to 563. However, there is more to this story. It is doubtful that Mary was even invited to the feast, given her history with Simon. Now, Ellen White, Christ might have extinguished every spark of hope in Mary's soul, but he did not. The heart searcher read the motives that led to her actions, and he also saw the spirit that prompted Simon's words. Now, remember that Simon was also critical of her, wasn't he? Seest thou this woman, he said to him, she is a sinner. And he could have Jesus said, you know, and I know how she got into this. I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much, 
but to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth, loveth little. And he said unto her, Thy sins are forgiven thee. Those present, thinking of Lazarus, who had been raised from the dead by Christ and who was at this time a guest in his uncle's house, began to question, saying, Who is this that giveth, that forgiveth sins also? So Lazarus and Mary and Martha were brother and sisters, weren't they? So Martha, Mary and Martha are both nieces of, of um, Simon. But Christ continued, Thy faith has saved thee, go in peace. From Signs of the Times, May 9 of 1900, also quoted in the book Daughters of God by Ellen White. We cannot pass over this story without rendering a comment, reading a comment from Luke also. That would be mine. Sometime later, Jesus, traveling through the towns and villages, preached the good news about the kingdom of God. The 12 disciples went with him, and so did some women who had been healed of evil spirits and diseases. Mary, who was called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had been driven out. So that's our Mary Magdalene. Joanna, whose husband chose was an officer in Herod's court, and Susanna, and many other women who used their own resources to help Jesus and his disciples. <clears throat> so who was supporting the cause of Jesus? The rich women. A lot of rich women, and probably a lot of women who weren't rich. Mary's gift was worth 300 denarii, or silver coins, a full year's wages. It was most likely a big jar gift. Following this incident, Jesus, uh, Judas betrayed Jesus for a little more than one-third of that amount. And I don't know where they got that one-third from. It's one-tenth, actually. A little jar gift, 30 pieces of silver. It takes real love and commitment to make big jar gifts from our investments. But when we get greedy, like Judas, we can sell our souls for next to nothing from our Bible study guide for Thursday, January 26. Okay, Jim? Matthew 26, 15. Judas asked, what will you give me if I betray Jesus to you? They counted out 30 silver coins and gave them to him. For then, from, to, then, on. from then on, Judas was looking for a good chance to hand Jesus over to them from the Good News Bible. Wow. I mean, I, I, I try to imagine myself in these stories. Can you imagine? Here's Judas, who's looking for a chance to, to betray Jesus. Here's Mary, who probably shouldn't even have been there because she has been led into sin by Simon. There is... Martha, who's busy serving. There's Lazarus, who's been raised from the dead. There's Simon, who's been healed from leprosy. And there's all the disciples and a lot of other people, I'm sure, as well. I mean, what, what a gathering. Wow. Okay, the Apostle of Barnabas is mentioned 20 times in the New Testament. <clears throat> Most of those mentions are because of his work with Paul. However, before that we read in Acts 4, 36 and 37, carry. And so it was that Joseph, a Levite born in Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, and in brackets which means one who encourages, sold a field he owned, brought the money, and handed it over to the apostles. That's from the Good News Bible. Now this is in contrast to the next chapter, which is the story of what? In Acts 5 we read about Ananias and Sapphira. Remember what they did. But here's someone who did what was right. And as Nias and Spira said, I'm going to bring a big jar gift. Yeah. yeah. And they gave part of the big jar gift. Yeah. Such sacrificial giving is important because when one gives such a gift, one's thoughts and emotions follow that gift. Remember that everyone, I'm sorry, everything we do, say, and think is recorded in the books yeah. of heaven. Ellen Pardon? White from Testimonies to the Church, Volume 2, said, I was shown that the recording angel makes a faithful record of every offering dedicated to God and put into the treasury and also to the final results of the means thus bestowed. 
The eye of God takes cognizance of every farthing devoted to his cause and of the willingness or reluctance of the giver. The motive is giving. The motive in giving is also chronicled. So our motives, not just our actions, but our thoughts and motives are recorded. The thoughts, every detail is recorded by God. Those suffering, those, those self-sacrificing, consecrated ones who render back to God the things that are his, as he requires of them, will be rewarded according to their works. Even though the means thus consecrated be misapplied so that it does not accomplish the work, so that it does not accomplish the object which the donor had in view, the glory of God and the salvation of souls, those who made the sacrifice and sincerity of soul with an eye single to the part to the glory of God will not lose their reward. So I guess okay. what's that saying is, you know, okay. even if the even if the church misuses the funds, God's still going to reward you. Yes, and it almost implies that we give our offerings and our tithes because we're looking for a what? A reward. A reward. Hmm. Let me give you something that I have yet to deal with. Now, we have a uh, mission station out in Arizona, we Adventists do, and they seem to be doing quite well. Now, regularly, I get something from a Catholic priest who is out there also fighting his way through, and uh, I, I look at that when I, I get the the mail, and it's like, what should I do? Ignore him? If I start giving him a gift or anything, the next thing I might have the Pope on the door. I, I don't know, but you see where I'm coming from. <laughs> yeah. And here's a man stuck out in the middle of nowhere, and he, I've seen a picture or two of it. Uh, he's got a, a set up out there, but he's not got too much money to do anything and you sort of feel sorry for him. Yeah. But uh, I don't yeah. know, maybe I should or, or I thought maybe I should send him a few of our magazines. This is White's early writings, is, I don't mm -hmm. know. Yeah. It's in the back of my mind quite often. Well, I, <laughs> I will tell you our experiences of we got one of the, the first place that we worked in Africa our hospital, where I was very, very busy, was located about five miles from the major Catholic seminary for the countries of Zambia and Tanzania. I'm sorry, Zambia and Malawi. Yeah. And we got to know those people quite well, the priests up there. And as we got closer to the time when we were getting ready to leave, I thought, well, I wonder what we could do here. Yeah. And I gave Desire of Ages and I think patriarchs and prophets yeah. to the Catholic priest. And he back, came back and said, these books are fantastic. He says, I'm using them for all of my uh, seminars I have for, for the Catholic people around here and my camp meetings and so forth like this. Thank you very much. You, you want, Maybe you should give him great controversy too. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, you wonder how, how God works in a situation like that. I've worked with a couple of Catholic nuns in years gone by. Yeah. I won't bog down now, but they were real Christian people. Yeah. One of our hospitals in Africa um, is really busy and, and we don't have very many staff. And there's two Catholic nuns who go out into the villages, treat people, find people who are sick and so forth, bring them into the hospital. They're almost, you know, might as well be members of the, of, the, of the staff there almost. Yeah. Think of all the people in the world whose main goal seems to be earn, to earn more money. Gordon, I think that's yours. In the Bible Study Guide, a well-known magazine in the United States told about young professionals on Wall Street who were making so much money and yet were so miserable, so empty, so full of angst and worry. One of them, a portfolio manager, said, what does it matter after I die if I made an extra 1% gain on my portfolio? 
Wow. From another section of the Bible study guide, in the scriptures, offerings must be given according to the blessing received and not merely based on a random percentage disconnected from the giver's prosperity. That's from Deuteronomy 16, 17 and Luke 12, 48. Additionally, in Old Testament times, there were, though they were voluntary, offerings also were essential in large worship feasts where the worshiper was not allowed to come before the Lord empty-handed, Deuteronomy 16, 16. And we've looked at those verses before. So, so, so should we not go to the worship service uh, without an offering? Well, that seems to be the way it was back in those days. But of course, if you only went to the church three times a year, <laughs> that would be more, you know. Are tithes mandatory because God says so? Are only because they are needed for the support of the ministry? Or do we need to give them for our own spiritual growth? Or for all of those reasons? Would you say all of the above? Our own spiritual growth? Does that, does tithing promote our own spiritual growth? As we've already stated, the commitment to donate the necessary funds for tithes and offerings is an important part of our worship of God. Like prayer, offerings are commitments of faith, Acts 10, verse 4. In the Old Testament, there are mandatory worship offerings, such as the atonement offerings and temple tax that's mentioned in Leviticus 1 to 5 and Exodus 30, 13 and 14. There also were free will offerings, the value and type of which were not prescribed, Exodus 25. But the scriptures show that both prescribed and mandatory offerings, as well as free will offerings, were essential in worship. However, although spontaneous, the offering, like any spiritual act, can become tainted by hidden selfish desires. For God to be pleased, the offering must be generous. The willingness of the giver also must be complemented by the joy of giving, which is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 and 7 and Galatians 5, 22. That's from our Bible study guide quoted. A careful survey of Leviticus 1 through 7 and Jim mentioned this earlier, will make it clear that the children of Israel were expected to make many sacrificial offerings in addition to their tithes and their support of the temple. There is considerable discussion about the use of the term free will or voluntary regarding offerings in the Bible. Jim? In the Bible study guide, in general, the Bible uses the word free will for offerings given in a spontaneous sense from the Exodus 26, 1 and 2, verse 2. It's actually Exodus 25 where the cursor verse, was there. Okay, Exodus 25, verses 1 and 2 and 2 Corinthians 8, 3. In terms of worship, spontaneous or free will doesn't necessarily mean optional. Before sin, duty and obedience were performed with a spirit of joy and willing love. Sin broke the unity between duty and a willing spirit. But in the Holy Spirit, duty and willingness are restored and reside in perfect unity once more. Voluntary means do not, <coughs> excuse me, do something of one's own free will without being pressured or compelled by someone else to do it. In general, the Bible tells us that voluntary offerings in worship proportional to the blessing or possessions received were essential for worship. Thus, because of their essential nature, voluntary offerings were not optional, except if the person made the decision not to serve the Lord, from the Bible study guide. So if you want to forget the whole thing and not worship God at all, then you don't have to pay your offerings. Okay? This is a little, a little confusing. Because of their essential nature, voluntary offerings were not optional. Is that clear to everyone? Because of their essential nature, voluntary offerings, they're essential, voluntary, but not optional. It's a little confusing, I think. Yeah. The wording is uh, from the teacher's guide there is. Yeah. Confusing, yeah. There were some occasions in the Bible 
when groups of people gave very generously. One of those was the building of the tabernacle at the foot of Mount Sinai. And uh, I'm going to read a couple of verses there. I'm sorry. I need to make this larger so we can read it. The people bring many gifts. Moses called Bezalel, Oholiab, and all the other skilled men to whom the Lord had given ability and who were willing to help Moses uh, told them to start working. They received from him all the offerings which the Israelites had brought, and I'm going to drop down. So Moses sent a command. Anyway, the people are bringing more than is needed for the work which the Lord commanded to be done. So Moses sent a command throughout the camp that no more was, was to make any camp that no one was to make any further contribution to the sacred tent. I mean, what an experience that was. Don't bring any more tithes or offerings. Yeah. What church has said that recently? Yeah. <laughs> Another was the experience we talked about last week with King Hezekiah, where something similar happened in his day. Are some offerings optional? Now let's get back to those words again. Carrie, is that you or is it Gordon? No, was, Carrie. Sorry, I was thinking what? Trying to figure out the option of a voluntary and yeah, a little confusing. On the other hand, the word optional generally means something elective, something that you are free to do or not to do. In the context of worship, vows were an example of optional acts, but offerings were part of the atonement, forgiveness, gratitude, and dedicatory aspects of worship. Spontaneous offerings, therefore, cannot be optional in worship. Thus, free will okay. offerings refer to offerings that originate from a heart that is filled with love and joy in obeying the Lord and in giving Him the most and best of what one possesses. So does that mean if you're thankful, you, you must give an offering? It's not optional. Is that what that passage it says? It's kind of what the Bible study guide, teacher's Bible study guide is suggesting, it yeah. seems. Yeah. Let's bring more, more money to the church. Yes. Well, remember that the one, that one was not really allowed to attend the festivals at the temple without bringing an offering. Now, I will tell you that uh, someone did a study, and I, I, I've quoted this a few times, I should bring the actual reference. Someone studied the, or well, not officially studied, but reported on the number of people that came to sacrifice in the temple about AD 40. So this would be roughly 10 years, eight or 10 years after Jesus was crucified. There were two million people estimated came to Jerusalem during the Passover. And so many people there that at that point in time, and I don't know whether this referred to on other occasions or not, but they actually, they, they couldn't sacrifice all the animals people want to bring, so they made 10 people came and, 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 uh, and confess their sins over one animal because they just couldn't kill animals fast enough. Just. Well, they said it was just like a river of blood yeah, going down yeah. into the Kidron Valley there from the, uh, and then wow. also they, they would do this. They'd say, okay, you're, uh, they'd bring their animal or their sheep or whatever it was and to, as a sacrifice. Oh, that isn't good enough. Uh, you, we'll, we'll take it away from you and we'll, we'll sell you another one. That, yeah. And then they'd recycle them. <laughs> yeah. Well, that offering is to be proportional to how God had blessed him. If you bring something, you must bring something and it must be in proportion to how God has blessed you. So if you come with a little tiny offering, you believe, people will believe that you're not very blessed. Is that right? Well, serving the Messiah is a voluntary act. I hope we all would agree with that. However, if we desire to be real Christians, that process includes free will and voluntary offerings. The ancient Jews were expected also to give feast offerings, as well as gratitude and atonement offerings. These are spelled out in considerable detail in the Levit Leviticus 1 through 7. And I can tell you that uh, I, I have at home a big sheet that spells out all the details. There were a lot of different offerings and all the details of 
when you bring this offering and when you bring that offering and so forth. So there was a lot of different offerings. Tithing, on the other hand, is mandatory. Remember Malachi 3, 8 through 10. Therefore, failing to give offerings and tithes is to rob the Lord, also in Malachi. Ellen White? I guess that's yours. Jim, is it? It's mine. He, I'm sorry. he has specified tithes and offerings as the measure of our obligation. Ellen White, Councils on Stewardship, page 80. The measure of our obligation. Okay. Again, wording that's a little, this means you figure out how much you owe and that's your obligation. The tithes from the various tribes of the Jews went to the Levites. The Levites in turn were expected to pay their tithes to the priests. The priests in turn were expected to pay their tithes to the high priest's family. Numbers 18, we have this spelled out, 25 to 28. The Lord commanded Moses to pay to say to the Levites, when you receive from the Israelites the tithe uh, that the Lord gives you as your possession, you must present a tenth of it as a special contribution to the Lord. In this way, you also will present the special contribution that belongs to the Lord from all the tithes which you receive from the Israelites. You are to give the special contribution to the Lord to Aaron the priest. So, and our church still follows that. From the conference, it goes to the union, and from the union, it goes to the general the division into the division that goes to the ten, the general conference, the 10%, 10%, 10%. The mandatory temple tax is also called an offering. Okay, Jim? Exodus 30, 13 and 14. Everyone included in the census must pay the required amount of money weighed according to the official standard. Everyone must pay this as an offering to me. Every one being counted in the census, that is, every man 20 years old or older is to pay me the amount from the Good News Bible. The Bible Study Guide we, says... We've talked about that before, but basically, they every year they were supposed to, everybody, every male 20 years old and older is to bring the special, the Bible, the New Testament calls it the temple tax. Well, my people that, uh, there's members of a synagogue. They mm -hmm. have a tax that they have to pay every year. Yeah. Prescribed or free will offerings are deducted, excuse denoted. me, denoted to the Bible by the use of certain terms. Bring, in quotes, the tithe, Matthew, uh, Malachi 3.10, give the temple tax, Exodus 29.28, and bring me an offering, Exodus 25.2. These expressions make it clear that the instruction from God must be obeyed. As such, in all the stages of the history of God's people, offerings were a duty to be performed with a willing heart, from the Bible Study Guide. Again, duty to be performed with a willing heart. Does it seem contradictory to suggest that the offerings were and are voluntary or free will, however, at the same time, some of them are, are or were called mandatory. Carrie? We find here in these verses the utterance of a divine command and the necessity of a willing heart. If the command is obeyed without a willing heart, the offering is not acceptable. That's quoting 2 Corinthians 9, 6, 7. Furthermore, if the give, giver rather has a willing heart, but his or her willingness is not out of love, 1 Corinthians 13, 1 to 3, and with joy, 2 Corinthians 9, 7, and nothing will be gained, 1 Corinthians 13, wow. 3. Adult teachers have a school Bible study guide. Yeah. Okay, so your offerings need to be given with love and joy. <clears throat> Notice some of the Bible writers, how some of the Bible writers dealt with this issue. Also from the Bible study guides, David's appeal to build Solomon's temple illustrates well the importance of internal motivation. Quote, who then is willing to consecrate his service this day unto the Lord? First Chronicles 29.5. As a result, the people rejoiced for that day they offered willingly because with perfect heart they offered willingly to the Lord. First Corinthians 29.9. Here are the same principles pointed out by Paul. 
quote, every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver, 2 Corinthians 9, 7, from the okay. Bible Study Guide. So we have focused on three fairly major contributions given in New Testament times. The poor widow in the temple observed by Jesus, the, centurion gen the centurion's generosity, and the gift of Barnabas. It is very easy to, for selfish human beings to use the expression free will or voluntary offerings as an excuse for giving only small amounts. The real question is, who is in charge of our hearts? Who is the king of our lives? God desires from all of his creatures the service of love, service that springs from an appreciation of the character he takes uh, from, from the, his character. He takes no pleasure in a forced obedience, and to all he grants freedom of will that they may render him voluntary service. Patriarchs and Prophets 34. It is no part of Christ's mission to compel men to receive him. It is Satan and men actuated by his spirit that seek to compel the conscience. Under a pretense of zeal for righteousness, men who are confederate with evil angels bring suffering upon their fellow men in order to convert them to their ideas of religion. So use force to convert people to religion. But Christ is ever showing mercy, ever seeking to win by the revealing of his love. He can admit no rival in the soul, nor accept of partial service, but he desires only voluntary service, the willing surrender of the heart under the um, constraint of love. Sorry. There can be no more conclusive evidence that we possess the spirit of Satan than the disposition to hurt and destroy those who do not appreciate our work or who act contrary to our ideas. Desire of Ages 487. So now, we've talked about optional and voluntary and required and what is meant by voluntary service under the constraint of love? In the paragraph above, is it love that makes it voluntary? Paul said that Christ's love left him no choice except to do what he did, all the way to his sacrificing his life. How much are we willing to give in proportion to our blessings? Is sacrificing your life, is that a proportional gift? Well, think about it. Let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, we thank you for the privilege we have of studying together, of learning together, and of returning thank offerings and even ties to you as required. May they be done with joy is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.